All right. Thank you, everyone. It's a uh, total pleasure to be here. I am happy to talk with you today about uh, learning to continually learn. Uh, this is work that I did at, uh, at Uber AI, although I'm now at OpenAI. So the idea that I want to talk to you about uh, first is kind of a very high level, perhaps the most high level thing that we could talk about, which is that how are we going to produce the most powerful AI imaginable, including human level AI, that's going to take us to a new idea I have for that approach called AI generating algorithms. And then I'm going to show you an instance of adopting that strategy, in particular, a new algorithm that we have called Animal that can help us solve continual learning or trying to mitigate catastrophic forgetting. So at the highest level, I think that everyone in this room is interested in the question of how we might be able to produce artificial general intelligence or human level intelligence, uh, human level AI, whatever you want to call it. And we don't usually as a community hear about how we might get there. We usually hear specific research topics on a more narrow question. But I think it's interesting to talk as a community about how we might get to these lofty goals. And I think that if you look at the machine learning community, I would say 99% of the community is committed to what I call the manual path to AI. It's never explicitly mentioned, but this is what we all seem to be about. And that is the idea that what we're going to do is try to collect the individual building blocks to artificial intelligence in like a phase one, which we are currently in. And if you think about trying to collect all of the building blocks you might need for a complex thinking machine, it becomes really, really daunting. You know, if you look at this list, for example, all of these things might be important or variants of them might be important. But that raises the question of how many more are out there? Are there hundreds or thousands of more building blocks that we would need to discover? And can we find them all one at a time manually as a community? But even if you could find all of those building blocks, it raises another question, which is, how are we going to put them together? There's kind of this Herculean task that nobody talks about, which is at some point, we're going to have to put all of these building blocks together into some giant, complicated, Rube Goldbergian thinking machine. And scientifically, that's extremely challenging. You have nonlinearly interacting parts. Debugging the system would be a mess. And you wouldn't be able to do it in the current research models of small groups of people working on like one or, you know, in Don's case, 15 papers a year. But in Instead, you'd need more like a CERN style project where you have all hands on deck trying to do one thing. So I think there's a clear trend in machine learning, which is that manually designed pipelines give way to learn pipelines as you have more compute and more data. And we've seen this already in features such as hog and sift giving away to deep learning, in architectures and hyperparameters. And we're increasingly learning the learning algorithms themselves now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that that suggests an alternate path to reaching our most grand AI ambitions. And that is what I call AI generating algorithms. So this would be research into the attempt to create create one algorithm that starts from simple initial conditions and bootstraps itself all the way up to producing complex, intelligent AI. It could do that via, for example, an expensive outer loop that's searching over architectures and uh, learning algorithms. And eventually, it produces on an, the inner loop something that is very sample efficient. Now, what's interesting about this approach is that we know it can work, because the very simple algorithm of Darwinian evolution produced your brain, and your brain is the most intelligent learning algorithm we know in the universe so far. So we know this can work, and I think we should try to recreate it inside of our AI algorithms. Now, to do that, we would need to simultaneously pursue research on what I call the three pillars of AI GAs. And that is that we would need to meta-learn the architectures, i.e. search for the right architecture, meta-learn the learning algorithms themselves, so have the algorithm invents its own learning algorithm. And then we also, and this is a pillar that is not worked on very much, we need to automatically generate the training environments that the system is learning on to bootstrap itself up from simplicity to complexity. Now, I and others have done work on all three of these pillars, but today I'm going to show you an example of pillar number two, specifically an, an approach of the meta-learning idea to solve a really hard challenge in machine learning. So this is a project that we call Learning to Continually Learn. We're going to put the paper out on archive any day now. And is with these fantastic collaborators led by Sean and Nick. Uh, with these institutions. So catastrophic forgetting is an Achilles heel of machine learning. It's not talked about a lot, especially at industrial events. But the idea is that if you're learning tasks in sequence, like when you deploy a system, if that system is actually learning in the world, if you first learn task A and then you learn task B, all machine learning systems that we currently know of will learn task B just fine, but they will do so at the expense of task A. If they have their parameters dedicated to task A and then they start learning task B, they'll just want 
wantonly overwrite the parameters that were used to store the information about task B and cannibalize that knowledge when learning, sorry, task A and cannibalize that knowledge when learning task B. Animals, including humans, don't forget catastrophically in this way. They forget gradually. When I haven't played volleyball in 15 years, but I guarantee you that if I started playing today, I would more or less pick up where I left off and be able to continue to level up in that skill set. So we have to solve this problem to solve the challenge of continually learning. Now, if you look through the years, there have been many proposed solutions to catastrophic forgetting and continual learning. All of them do interesting things, but what I would say is they're all kind of in the manual uh, path to AI. They th think that they know how to construct a system that will solve this problem, and they work okay. But I want to particularly highlight this example of encouraging sparse representations. The f manual path frequently takes the strategy of saying, I think that sparse representations would help. So I'm going to create, for example, an auxiliary loss. I'm going to reward the system to learn and also have sparse representations, and then hope that that helps me with continual learning, because I think that that's true. And that can work to some extent, but I think the meta-learning philosophy teaches us that there is a better approach, and that is don't optimize for one thing and hope for another. Instead, specifically optimize for what you want out of your system, which in this case is to learn uh, to continually learn. So my hypothesis is that we are not smart enough as individuals to figure out how to create systems that solve continual learning and catastrophic forgetting. And that we should you know, use an alternative proposal, which is the meta-learning philosophy, which is that we should directly learn to continually learn, which is to say optimize for what we want, which is I want to learn a sequence of tasks. And then at the end, I want to be good on all the tasks, not the last task. And that simple flip allows us to do wonderful things. So within this idea of meta-learning or learning to learn, there are two camps. One of them is that you meta-learn a good initial set of weights, and then you subject them to SGD. That's kind of the mammal style. And then there's another approach called RL squared, or learning to reinforcement learning. And today, we're going to focus on the first one. So uh, the idea here is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an initial set of weights for my neural network here, theta 1, and then I'm going to copy those weights over and let them learn according to SGD on some task, whatever that is, and they're going to take a whole bunch of individual steps on SGD. At the end, I get a trained neural network, and I'm going to evaluate that trained neural network on some task some task, which we call the meta loss. And then the idea is that you differentiate back through this entire learning process, all the way back to these initial weights that you started with, and you take a gradient step to say, how should these weights have been different, such that the next time I hand these weights to a process, after it goes through all of this learning, at the end, it's good at the thing that I want it to do. That is the mammal style. So we call this, uh, this process here down this axis, this is meta-training. And each meta-training step involves this inner loop of other learning. Now, I want to introduce some terminology. We call this meta-train training, because the system is training on one task. And then you have meta-train testing. You test it on this thing. And it's meta-train testing that gives you your loss that goes back and you take these gradient steps here. After you do all of that training, so after you do meta-training multiple times, you get a final initial neural network set of weights, and then your meta-training is over. Now you flip to what we call meta-testing. Now, since the system is learning to learn, if you want to test whether or not it learned to learn, you need to have it learn for a while and then see how it did after learning. So that means that within meta-testing, you have meta-test training. You're going to give it some more data that it's never seen before on a task it's never seen before, maybe, and then test it on some new stuff to see how well it learned from these examples. So it gets very complicated, but we're going to adopt this language of meta-test training, meta-test testing to differentiate these two things. OK, now, to make it even more complicated, we want this to be done in the continual learning setting. So what's going to happen is that inside of each of these inner loops, it's going to learn on one task, say chess, then another task, say volleyball, then you know, a whole bunch of tasks. And at the end of all of that training on T tasks, we're going to evaluate it to see how good it is on all of them, which is to say, did it learn without forgetting? And this is the loss we're going to take back to this initial parameter vector here. That's how you do this in a continual learning setting. So so there, we had been working on this for years, um, and it wasn't working as well as we would like. And then Martha White and company came out with a paper that I thought was really, really inspiring and really good that also was taking this approach. And so we dropped what we were doing, and we kind of switched to um, copy a lot of what they were doing. And the, their paper, which is called OML for Online Aware Meta Learning, uh, validates this vision of meta learning solutions to continual learning. We were inspired by it, and we compare to it. So the way that OML works is the following. You have an initial 
initial task, say Omniglot, and you train a neural network to solve that problem. But what they do is that they meta-learn these blue weights here, which are they call the representation learning network, and then they're going to freeze those at test, meta test time and just have some little tiny SGD happening in these red layers here, which is what they call the prediction learning network. And so you've meta-learned a representation such that when it is done training, it will be good at being subjected to SGD and having that SGD layer learn without forgetting, which is kind of cool. So OML performs really well, uh, as, and after sequentially learning on 150 t classes of Omniglot, it had scores 97% on the meta train, sorry, the meta test uh, training set, which is to say the examples it just saw and memorized. It doesn't generalize as well, but it's still very important. And also really interesting is it, oops, sorry, is it meta learned to create sparse representations. So here is this uh, technique here, and on each individual image, it, not that many neurons are acting, but across the whole data set, all of the neurons are being used, and it actually does a better job of that than directly encouraging sparse representations. So it kind of learned to do what we thought might be a good idea. So this paper gets a lot right, but it's still ultimately subjected to SGD at uh, training time. It just has to hope that SGD doesn't corrupt what it came up with, and I think that instead we should optimize the entire system to learn without forgetting, and that's what we're going to do. So the question is, can we do better? And we propose allowing control over all of the learning process by kind of allowing control over SGD via this technique that we call neuromodulation. This is an old idea. It's the idea that there's a neuron inside of the deep neural network that can modulate the learning of other neurons in the network. Uh, that allows task-specific learning, like learning in different parts of the network it, for different tasks. Now, a problem, and my lab has worked on this for quite a long time, and we've shown that on simple neural nets, you can actually perfectly solve catastrophic forgetting with these techniques, but we were struggling to scale it up to deep learning scales and very hard problems. And then Sean on our team came up with an insight, which is that traditional neuromodulation was only changing the learning. It wasn't changing the forward pass. And so that means that I have a chess playing part of my network and a volleyball playing part of my network, but when I run them, they both kind of clobber each other in the forward pass and mess up the performance of the network. So maybe we need to allow neuromodulation to control both. And so what we do is we have what we call activation-based neuromodulation. That's neuromodulation that directly modulates both the forward pass, the activations of a network, and that allows it to indirectly then affect the backward pass because now the gradients flowing backward through the network are going to be different. That allows selective activation and selective plasticity. So we call this a neuromodulated meta-learning algorithm, or ANIMAL, and the idea is very similar to OML, except we're going to have a separate network here, which is this blue network. So the red network here is your typical normal neural network. It has a feed-forward pass. There's going to be a separate parallel network that is going to be also looking at the data and saying, oh, that's chess or that's volleyball, so I want to allow these activations, this part of the network, to fire, not this part of the network. That gates the forward pass, and then that also indirectly gates the backward pass. So for example, Normal deep learning has inference everywhere in the forward pass. Animal, in contrast, will gate some of the activations on the forward pass, and that will affect the gradient flow during the backward pass. We're going to do this on Omniglot, so this is one class. These, you have to learn these characters, then these characters, then these characters. And the, the, ideally, what you do is you would differentiate through, say, 600 tasks. Learn 600 things in a row, differentiate all the way back, and take a gradient step. That's not possible. So uh, the OML paper came up with a really good uh, approximation of that loss function, which is learn one new task and then see after you learn that if you know that task and you know a random sampling of previous tasks you've seen because that means you learned the new thing without messing up things you already know. So um, that's that. So what we're going to do here is you're going to see on a new task, we're going to show one new character, another new character. It's taking inner loop SGD steps. Eventually, at the end, we're going to test uh, whether or not it learned those characters and some other characters it already trained on. That's one step. Take a gradient step, do that for, an, uh, for another class, et cetera. And in OML, you update the blue weights. In MAML, you update the blue weights and the, I'm sorry, you, you meta learn these blue weights and you let this thing learn inner loop. Now, one final hint is that at meta test time, we are going to freeze this thing just like OML did. It turns out to help, uh, although it's not required. 
Okay, at meta testing, what we're going to do now is we're going to show it some new classes. It's never seen these classes before. We show it, say, you know, 15 characters of this new class, and then we can do and measure two things. First thing we can do is say, how good after seeing those 15 are you on those 15? How well did you memorize what you were just uh, shown? But uh, those are that's what we call meta test training and meta test training performance. We can also ask, how good are you on the meta test test set? So these are held out characters from this class that it's never seen before. And we can put those dots here because it's only seen one class so far. We could then redo the whole thing for two tasks and put dots here. And then we could do it for 600 class ta uh, tasks and say, how well did you do on these two marks after all of this 600 classes of learning, which is a lot. So I just want to remind you really quickly that continual learning is really hard. You have to not only learn things sequentially, and deal with catastrophic forgetting, whereas normal deep learning samples things IID, so there is no catastrophic forgetting, but you also only get one pass through the data uh, so instead of deep learning that has multiple. So here are uh, some very brief results on the meta test training set. So how well did it memorize the things it just saw, even though it's never seen these classes before, but we did give it labels at meta test training. What you can see here is that OML, this thing that worked really well, it works well about to 200, and then it kind of falls off a cliff as you go forward. Um, and if you train from scratch, normal deep learning, or you pre-train and then you train, all of that doesn't work at all. In contrast, Animal, which is here in blue, actually works remarkably well across the meta test training set all the way up to 600 classes. Now, this blue green line here is OML. We were able to get a different hyperparameter setting for OML that also made it work really well on meta test training. When you switch to meta test testing, though, you see this uh, marked difference between OML and Animal, no matter which version of OML you use. So now this is the harder challenge of I just saw some new classes, I've never seen them before, and you've given me some labeled examples. How well can I ex uh, recognize other examples of those images? And on that case, all the way out to 600, you see the OML family fall, uh, not doing very well, and Animal having this nice performance bump and doing much, much better after 600 sequential classes and 9,000 steps of SGD, which is, to my knowledge, by far the best we've seen in terms of catastrophic forgetting. One uh, thing that I want to point out really quickly is that one way to isolate the effect of catastrophic forgetting in these systems is to take the performance if you train on that same data IID, so just random shuffling, not sequential, that performance gives you like your upper bound or oracle of how well you could do on this task, and then you subtract off how well you do when you do it sequentially, and that gap is kind of the effect of catastrophic forgetting. And what we're seeing is that if you do that with normal deep learning, you get a massive drop, forget about it, it's 99%, it doesn't work at all in the sequential case. Pre-training also falls off a cliff. OML did quite well, about a 50% re reduction in catastrophic forgetting. Animal is down to all the way down to like 8%. So I would say that more or less, catastrophic forgetting is no longer the thing that's really holding the system up. Animal has more or less on this task solved the majority of the problems due to catastrophic forgetting, which is very exciting. My last result side before concluding is that also like OML, Animal is on its own learning to produce sparse representations. So these are three different random images from the meta test test set. And what you can see is on these images, different neurons are firing, but not all of the neurons. But on average, Animal is using all of its capacity and, and is efficiently using the, the, the neurons we give it. In contrast, sorry, if you look at re rewarding sparsity, you see about 14% of these neurons tend to be entirely dead because it kind of overshoots the mark. But with animal and OML, none of the neurons are dead. They're all used by the system. So to conclude, I think uh, it's very interesting to see that Animal can learn 600 classes sequentially uh, and still perform pretty well on average. I think that it, uh, we, the way that it does that is harnessing neuromodulation, including multiplicative gating. That allows it to have selective activation and selective plasticity. It learns on its own, like OML, to produce sparse representations. It probably also invents all sorts of other tricks we don't even know about to solve the problem of catastrophic forgetting. And in future work, we want to scale this to more and harder domains. And I think the overall conclusions here are that both OML and animals show the promise of meta-learning solutions to, the, uh, to catastrophic forgetting and continual learning in general, but they also validate kind of the overall vision of AI generating algorithms, which is that we should go all in on meta-learning the solutions to the hardest challenges in AI. And that raises the question for everyone in this room and the research community, what other grand challenges in machine learning could we tackle successfully with this approach? Exploration, safe exploration, general 
generalization, solving adversarial examples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the sky is the limit to kind of test what this paradigm can do. And so the last point I'll make is that I think that the results we've seen with Animal and some of our other work have really increased my confidence, which was already high, that the AI generating algorithm path will be the fastest path to producing truly powerful AI systems. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.